As a health professional treating patients from many diverse cultures and religious faith, it's important to observe cultural customs and sensitivities of the different communities, both as a mark of respect, but also to allow the patient to feel more comfortable. This is especially important when treating our Indigenous community, and as such, I'm very privileged to be joined by Kendall Fitzgerald. She's a local Ghana and Narunga woman who has worked and lived in the Aboriginal community all her life, and she spent 22 years working as an Aboriginal health worker in two major hospitals in Adelaide. She's currently working in education and has agreed to be interviewed on Aussie Med Ed to outline some aspects of Indigenous health and culture from a health treatment perspective. Good day and welcome to Aussie Med Ed, the Australian medical education podcast designed with a pragmatic approach to medical conditions by interviewing specialists in the medical field. I'm Gavin Nyman, an orthopedic surgeon based in Adelaide, and I'm broadcasting from Ghana land. I'd like to remind you that this podcast is available on all podcast players and is also available as a video version on YouTube. I'd also like to remind you that if you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe or leave a review or give us a thumbs up as I really appreciate the support and it helps the channel grow. I'd like to start the podcast by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is produced, the Ghana people, and pay my respects to the elders both past, present and emerging. I'd like to remind you that all the information presented today is just one opinion and that there are numerous ways of treating all medical conditions. Therefore, you should always seek advice from your health professionals in the area in which you live. Also, if you have any concerns about the information raised today, please speak to your GP or seek assistance from health organisations such as Lifeline in Australia. Well, it's my pleasure now to introduce Kendall Fitzgerald. Welcome, Kendall. Thank you very much for coming on Aussie Med Ed. Thank you for having me, Gavin. Good to be here, as nervous as I am. <laughs> well, well, I'm delighted to have you on. It's fantastic to hear about this really important subject and to learn a bit more about the Indigenous community and culture and history. So thank you very much for coming on board. Yeah, no worries. Um, I'm going to ask if you can start off by telling me a little bit about yourself and yep. also about the Ghana and Narunga people and community. That's a little bit about the history and a little bit about yourself and your involvement in it. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so like you said, I'm a Ghana Narunga woman. They're the two language groups that I identify with. And as most of you would know, the Ghana area is our local Adelaide area and Narunga um, country is over on the York Peninsula. And so, yeah, I've grown up here in Adelaide and I've been very strongly connected with the community here. So it's funny, my colleagues when they see me out at community events, they're just like, oh, God, you know everybody, you know, and that's something that's really strong about our culture. So I guess leading in to culture, um, when, when you look at the map of Australia and all of the different language groups that are made up within the country, you know, there's over 200. And I think before colonisation there was well over 700 languages with, with sort of overlapping kind of dialects. So when we talk about our average culture is stronger in certain parts of the country than it is in others. So for us here in Adelaide, colonisation had a huge effect on our culture. For example, I, don't, I can't speak my own language because it was lost. And we know that past government policies kind of prevented us from speaking language, so it's been lost along the way. Thankfully though, seeing some huge steps across quite a lot of languages where they're being rebuilt with linguists in universities and stuff like that. So I am really proud to say in August this year, I enrolled to go and learn Ghana language. So that's been really, what's the word, empowering for me. So I go off once a week and I do it. And I'm trying to incorporate that around the house and at school. So, yeah, that's been good. And I was actually going to open up, actually, by saying Nina Mani, Gavin, because that means, hi, how are you? Yeah, have you heard that term before? Oh, okay. I do believe one of our lecturers actually used that when we had one of our podcasts previously, and I realised that's what she was mentioning. So yeah, it's actually, yeah. I'm quite keen to learn a few more words as well. Yeah, well, that so. can be another thing that I can keep forwarding to you. So, yeah, normally you'd say Nina Mani, and then if you're well, you would reply with Mani I. Yeah. Anyway, uh -huh. so that's a language, I guess, that I'm finding really good for me, a culture. And then especially for my children who are, I guess, growing up in a Western world. But again, when we talk about culture and having strong connections in the community, culture for me is not only, you know, practising culture, ceremonies, all that kind of stuff. It's just, you know, we've got a modern way of culture and it's how we connect with each other. And I think some of those things, it's sort of hard to explain what I mean, but 
you know, aunties and uncles, those kinship relationships, people I call auntie and uncle or cuz or brother, sister, might not be my immediate brothers and sisters. It's just how we connect. Yeah, and like, so it's really hard to explain. And I guess a lot of cultural groups would probably have similarities with those kind of connections. Well, I did do a little bit of reading for this interview today. Yes. And a couple of things that really came to mind when I was reading up about Indigenous culture was factors of connection to country, family and kinship, and caring for country. And ironically, in this post-COVID era, it's almost it's a funny that the Western community is actually heading towards those areas about the importance of looking after themselves and their family, about the importance of sustainability in the environment. And so the Western community is trying to emulate what Indigenous cultures yeah. always had, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yep. It has made us sort of realise those very basic, important things, I guess. And you're right, you're 100%. Yeah, I know for me, you know, I live in this past world, work, kids, married. When I go back out to your peninsula on country, that sense of, oh, you know, that, that feeling. Yeah, it's amazing. And again, other people can relate to that as well. You might have a, you know, some of us have got those places where we might come from, which might be out in the country and just that feeling that you get. But yeah, you're right. Connection to country is really important. And I think that's why when we do acknowledgements and welcomes, we've got to really um, remember the significance of those. And I thought I would touch on those because they do relate to culture. I think we've come a long way when we're doing, you know, you're at an event or in a meeting and we do acknowledgements and everyone's doing them now and it's really good. And I think we're now at a point where um, we don't want to overuse them. We want to make them meaningful. And actually there's a TED talk, Gavin, I'm going to share with you. It is brilliant and it's around acknowledgements and welcomes. So... I know, you know, we've seen in the media about, you know, acknowledgement of countries, why do we have to do them? And I guess when you think about culture, it's we're kind of mirroring what our ancestors would have done. And because Aboriginal people travelled a lot, if we went, if we, we were travelling or whatever and we went to someone else's country, those people would be welcoming and they'd say, welcome, you know, this is our country, where are you heading? Where are you from? You know, we ask those questions. Oh, cool. Okay, well, if you're heading north, go go this way. Go up that way because that's a safe travel. Or well, don't go that way over there because there might be women's business happening over there. So it is a nice, strong part of culture that I guess we're preserving and wanting to share with the general community. So it's really good. And I really love working in schools because I think our our future generations are really getting that right. And again, we've come a long way with those acknowledgements in that it's, we've always traditionally sort of, we, you know, we give someone a script and we go here, this is what you say, but it almost doesn't have meaning anymore. So we're now shifting, I guess, to more meaningful acknowledgements and there's ways to do that. Yeah. It's rather than sounding robotic. Does that make sense? Very much so. I, certainly at the uh, start of our podcast, we have an acknowledgement to country, yeah. which I actually obtained a, a formal one from the, I think, the College of Surgeons years ago. But as I said to you when speaking to you previously, I feel like I should say, look, I, I feel very privileged about it, to share the Indigenous lands uh, and acknowledge that it is Indigenous lands, the Ghana people, mm. and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders uh, who have yeah, actually yeah. allowed us to share these lands. So. That's from more from the heart as opposed to a robotic sort of speech. And, Absolutely. And I, of course, always, I've always yep. been concerned about whether that was better to do it or not. Oh. And I think you mentioned that it was certainly appropriate and better Abs than the standard. Absolutely. Was. And I guess when we are thinking about sort of moving into the, the health context, you know, like if I can share how I came to know you, Gavin, coming into your clinic and, you know, seeing that sign on your door, it was just a simple sticker I'd located on Ghana land. That spoke volumes to me, you know, just a simple gesture is huge. And to me, that's kind of a step in your, you know, you've taken part in that, those steps to reconciliation and stuff because it's saying, welcome, come, in, come into our clinic, you know. Yeah. 
So sometimes it is just those really little things. Yeah. And I guess in the wider health context, like you said, I worked in two major hospitals across a span of 20 years, 10 years being in women's and children's hospital, the other 10 being in Flinders Medical Center. Absolutely loved my work there. I learned so much and yes, that was a long time and I'm 47 years old now. I still continue to learn every day. I think it's like anything. We never stop learning. And one of the, you know, the things for me in doing that kind of work and, and part of my role. So I was a liaison officer, basically helping metropolitan Aboriginal people, but also a large, probably about 80% of our patients were from rural and remote areas. So just helping them to navigate the hospital system and helping with that two way communication between medical staff and them. And that was challenging sometimes, but you know, the, the, the one message that we were constantly getting across is, you know, we're such a diverse people. So what might be right culturally for one is certainly going to be different to the next person. And that I don't know all those answers, but it's just about being sensitive, really culturally sensitive. And again, I, I guess I can only reflect on my experiences in hospitals. And I guess it's like any of us with our jobs these days where we're providing a service to people. We're very time, we're under time constraints. We're very task orientated. Whereas I really encourage you to kind of just spend a couple of minutes, you know, you know, if you're unsure about how that person's feeling, whether they're feeling comfortable, just, you know, how you going? So who's your mob? You know, where are you from? And I'm sure you do that anyway, kind of thing. But I just know that in the hospital setting, some of our more rural people would just, that just close up because it was like, you know, they come in and they want to take a history and they want to do this and they want to do that. It's just bang, bang. And they just go, oh my God, this is overwhelming. But just, you know, just a few minutes to get to know them. I guess gender issues can be an issue sometimes. And, I, and is it okay to just share some examples? of things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just remember once being in a room in a hospital with a patient, but I knew that there was a quite a traditional man in the next room who was getting prepped for an angiogram. And I could hear the female nurse saying, you know, really loud, and the door was open. I'm sure she would have shut the door eventually, but you know, okay, it's time, you know, we've had she had to shave him down in that pelvic area. And she was very, really loud and I could just, I was just cringing because I thought she's not doing anything wrong, but there would, probably would have been more appropriate to have a male nurse doing that, given that this man was, you know, quite traditional. Um, I guess the other thing too is assumptions as well and our unconscious biases. I, I, I do. I know it's something I'm constantly working on with me with, with certain things and, and people in society, but... You know, and, and this is just another example, but I had, because we are a minority group, Aboriginal people. Unfortunately, sometimes we are stereotyped. Not everyone does it, but we still sometimes are painted all with the one brush. And I never forget working with this beautiful woman who had spent a lot of time. She lived in the country. And she had to come to Adelaide because she had really bad liver disease and she needed a transplant. And her nurse was just casually talking to her and I found out about this because the patient came to see me really upset and she said the nurse was lovely you know they were having a good old chat but it came up in conversation around the assumption that her liver disease was caused through alcohol use when it simply wasn't but it was just that you know it's just that unconscious bias kind of stuff so yeah but I think you know medical students are getting some really good training these days uh, I mean, I haven't been in the health system for about eight years now, but I know even towards, you know, those last few years that I was sort of leaving, there was lots of really good stuff happening. And it was actually part of our role as well was to talk to some of the, the, the students as well. So that was always really good. You get lots of good questions. Yep. Well, you're saying really obviously showing respect and giving time to form a relationship before Absolutely. going into an inter interview, yeah. take a history and examination. and. Uh, one word actually you popped up actually was in my in my mind to ask you if it did come up was obviously I'd talk about Indigenous communities or, the, or the tribe, uh, but I know you regularly use the word mob. Is it appropriate for me to refer to 
Indigenous group as a mob or is that more from, coming from an Indigenous person? Yeah, I guess it just depends on the context and who you speak um, to. Like, um, it's a really good question, actually. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. And I guess you would know, you would probably get the feeling of, of when it's maybe right to use it. Yeah, it's part of yeah. our vocab in the community. Yeah, how are you and your mob going or, you know, yeah. I, I use it a lot. Well, that's, yeah, that's a, I have heard you mention it before, so that did pop into my head as well. So yes, the, you talked about the obviously the sensitivities between the female nurse preparing the male patient. What about the opposite as well? Male nurses being involved, or male doctors being involved in female patients as well. What are the sensitivities there, and are there things that we need to observe, uh, particularly yep. more than in in general Western communities as well? Oh, look, I guess. You know, again, and like you said, so we're so diverse and everyone's needs are going to be so different to the next person. It's all gender, those gender balances are always good to have in the back of your mind. But, you know, we also get that it just can't always be helped due to resources or, you know, staffing. So, you know, and yeah, it can't always be helped. But usually patients have got a family member or... And again, I'm only reflecting on my hospital sort of experiences. There were us, there were liaison officers who could be present if a patient wanted that support or, yeah. But someone like me, you know, city girl, I, I, you know, I'm quite fine to navigate my way through, through services and whatnot, and that's not so much an issue for me. Yeah. Okay. In your job as a liaison health worker, what were the main issues that you'd find that would actually come up in the scenario, was it purely communication? Yeah, and again, I'm sort of speaking in there, you know, with people from rural remote areas who were a large proportion of the patients that we were working with. A lot of the time, um, you know, nursing staff would call down and they'd say, can you come up and see so-and-so? We're struggling with communication. I think they need an interpreter. And in my 22 years working in hospitals, I think I've booked an interpreter twice. It was just that, you know, yes, English was more often than not their second language, but it was just how that communication happened that, you know, and again, when you're in a rush, you need to get things done. But I guess that was our role as well, would be to to sit there and help facilitate that kind of conversation. But more often than not, they, they knew English, they could understand English. And I guess you've got to be very careful too, when you've got someone signing a consent to bypass surgery or something, you want to make sure that they understand what they're signing off to. So, so yeah. What are some of the other issues? Just homesickness was a huge thing. Coming from a rural area into a big hospital was huge. So um, just trying to help them with that sort of stuff, trying to get them out. A lot of the time they'd say, can you take me to the beach? I've never been to the beach. If they were sort of Central Australian mob, what else sort of did we sort of deal with? Just lots of practical things while they were in Adelaide as well. When I was 15, I had to have an operation, so I had no medical knowledge. And I do recall the nurse giving me a kidney-shaped dish when I felt sick. And I thought to myself, well, I better not get that dirty. That's obviously something really important. Oh. And so it gave me a bit of insight. I had no medical idea. And so we as a medical health professionals assume people know what things are for. And I think that's what you're saying here as well. You're saying speak more uh, sensibly rather than try and use medical terms. 100%. In the, in the community. Yeah, that's it. A lot of these things don't just apply for our mob. They apply for a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. And I remember I remember going off to hospital once to emergency because I was having chest pain. It turned out to be like just a muscle thing. But I remember spending two nights in hospital having all these tests and really, yeah, like, like you said when you were younger, getting an understanding of what it's like being on the other side. And I didn't like it. I really, I mean, everyone was wonderful to me and they looked after me beautifully, but I couldn't wait to get out. I just didn't like being on that other side of the, so yeah, it gave me an appreciation of what um, it's like for some of our people. And then add on top of that, being so far away from home. Mm. And I guess, I mean, we can come back to the medical stuff, but I've just got to move into sort of where I'm at now and working in a school, a boarding school here in Adelaide, I was kind of attracted to that position because 
I'd come from a role where I was supporting people who are a long way from home to supporting students who are a long way from home in, you know, in schooling. And I've been in this school now for seven years, really love it. I love what's happening in schools in general these days around education and culture sharing. And one of the big things, one of my, one of my main roles is just supporting our Indigenous students or Aboriginal students, but I'm really big on and very passionate about sharing culture with the wider school community. And I'm really hoping that, you know, over the generations, we'll see some changes and some more, I guess, young people in our society who are understanding and, yeah, and, and sensitive, yeah. Mm. That's great. I know we, there's, you know, sometimes people might not know, oh, you know, I want to experience some culture or, I don't, you know, I want to, you know, are there any, um, is, that, is that something you sort of came for me to share about, like what's around yes, in Adelaide? Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so what we do yeah. at our college is for all our year seven, so they're the youngest in the school every year, when they come into our school, it's in term one, so it's in the first two weeks of school, we have them go with an, a, a Ghana elder in our local area. When I am say local, I'm in the Glenelg sort of Nova Gardens area. And this elder takes all these year sevens on a tour around the area and talks to them about what, you know, what it was like here prior to civilization. And one of the places he visits is the Glenelg Golf Club. Because when you look at that's still got a lot of I guess the grasses, the, the ponds, and you know, it was a very hilly, sandy area. So, you know, there's a big hill there and he talks about that, how that was a big area where they went for messaging to other groups and how the smoke would travel. Like, it's really fascinating. So our young people are, are getting some of this stuff. Um, we also have some people teaching Ghana in schools as well. I mean, years ago, there was only a few people who could speak it, but that's really growing by the number, which is really good. And I'm hoping I can incorporate some of that stuff into my role as well as I get more confident with it. Yeah, you've got tours and stuff you can do down at the Botanic Gardens where you can learn about sort of the local, you know, plant life, I guess. And But, yeah, there's lots of stuff. There's the Trabuki Trail. Have you heard about that? No, I haven't heard that one. Yeah, no. so the Trabuki Trail, it sort of runs along our coastline starting, I think it kind of starts sort of around the, right in the area down, right down. But it's a dreaming story. It's a Ghana dreaming story. And there are places that you can visit to kind of, like there's a monument at Kingston Park, like a statue thing that they, which is Jabruki holding his, his nephew. I won't go into the story because it will take too long. But, you know, so there's those kinds of things. I was going to ask you on that point, with Indigenous culture, is the country considered the god or... Is there a God in, in an Indigenous religion or is there a religion? That's a really good question, actually, and I talk a lot to students about this, but um, culture for us and I guess spirituality for us is the dreaming. And so lots of Aboriginal groups, cultural groups, have lots of dreaming stories. And dreaming stories aren't just something we sit down and talk, you know, tell the storytelling for kids, but it kind of guided us around rules for living law you know the do's and the don'ts and these are the consequences if you do they also taught us about creation and an example of that again with the trabuki story is a lot of the waterways down along the coast were created by trabuki crying for his nephew so those sorts of things are so valuable so i guess they're our you know the center of our culture i guess and guided us for living and not doing the wrong thing some groups don't call it dreaming. Yeah, and that's a bit more complex. I probably won't go into that, and I really don't know enough about it to do that. But, yeah, dreaming stories are, are really huge, and it's, yeah, I know I love sharing them with my daughters, even though I, I wish I knew more, but, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, and the other thing I was just going to say too is um, I now, I don't know, you get a bit more passionate about things as you get older, but I'm out now teaching um, weaving. I do, I work part-time in a school and then part-time I run my own little business teaching basket weaving. And that's okay. been really, Excellent. it's, let me just say like it's, I'm just getting bookings and I'm not even trying to, because people want that stuff, especially schools. 
Yeah, that's really cool. Things have certainly changed a lot since I was little for the better. Yeah, still got a long way to go, but yeah. Are there anything in particular we need to be aware of? We talked about being respectful to the patients. Is there anything like in some communities, for instance, it's not appropriate to do too much eye contact, especially for a guy to a lady? Is there anything in particular like that we need to be aware of? Yeah. Yeah, look, that certainly can sometimes be an issue. And I guess it's not so much you worrying about what you need to do, but I guess just reading the room and, again, with assumptions, I know people sometimes go, oh, they weren't making eye contact with me, so I don't think they understood. Well, that is really not the case. So just if someone isn't making eye contact with you, it doesn't mean they're not listening or engaging. It might just be, you know, it is a cultural thing and I don't know why I can't explain it, but it is a common thing. But yeah, you know, as far as the language goes, it was two German guys who would um, down the, by the Torrens, it was a common meeting area for Ghana people. And these two German guys started recording words and stuff back in the 1800s. And yeah, they, they documented about three to 4,000 words, I think. And they sort of documented around 400 sentences or something like that. So that's kind of formed the basis or the foundation for us to try and rebuild the language from what they they documented everything, whereas we pass stuff down through verbal storytelling, dancing, ceremonies. That's how our information was passed down. Painting, rock paintings, yeah. Nowadays, are there any regular meeting places where the Ghana tribe will catch up and or are there any other ceremonies or anything that you might be involved in at all that you do? No, not really. Here in Adelaide, we are both where Ghana land here, our Adelaide Aboriginal community is really made up of people from all over the place. Obviously people work and travel and move around and so a lot of the, you know, I go to, I also go to events and stuff, you know, music events or, or sometimes, you know, it's more so getting together around rallies. Yeah, lots of it's music. Sometimes like smoking stuff, which is usually open to the public, smoking ceremonies and things. Yeah, usually whatever's happening in the community, I'll go to it, but it's not so much of a cultural practice. It's more of a get together. Yeah, and again, lots of people in the community, and it's funny because we just all connect with each other, but they might be from different areas, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kendall, what you've really said to me today is that is really treat everyone the way we treat ourselves and be respectful to people and give them time to process things and be aware that the health industry can be overwhelming. Yes. And it's really common sense in, yes. in what people should be doing routinely anyway. And yet your culture and your history is amazing and I particularly love the kinship and the community spirit that, that you that you present and mm. the Indigenous community presents too, which is really what life should be all about as well. Oh, so. I, yeah. It, it is really a lovely thing. And I know because my husband's Caucasian and he just says I'm so envious of what you have, you know, because he has his family and then he has his cousins and, you know, and they all, they're all loving family and whatnot, whereas we got community. Yeah, and it's... It's really lovely and getting, I've grown up with it and now I'm getting to see my daughters grow up in that and it um, makes us feel really rich, yeah. But, yeah, you're right, back to, you know, I guess kind of engaging with people. There's no little tricks or, you know, it is. It's just that common kind of sense and just being sensitive really is the, the main thing. Are there any particular support people we should turn to in this scenario if we've got a, a patient that we feel is struggling with our healthcare we're delivering to them. I know in the public hostels we have access to liaison workers yes. like yourselves in the past. But what about in, in a outside setting? Where do people turn to? Where would I go to if I had a patient I was concerned about to get you, some support for them? You could call, like you've got places like Nunkawara Nulti in Adelaide. Do you know that? That's a community-controlled Aboriginal health service. So they could oh, pro yes. probably offer some advice and stuff. 
So these are all community controlled health services where they will have clinics, programs and whatnot. So just for advice, I'm sure they'd be happy to take a call for some advice. Also here in Adelaide, I don't know if you've ever heard of ANTAC, but basically over the years, I guess, through the work of a lot of different people within hospitals, within the Aboriginal Health Service, have recognised a need to make traditional healers available to complement the Western medicine kind of stuff. And I know in my time as a liaison officer, it was really hard to get traditional healers. And we'd only be looking for them if patients asked for them because I guess we've got to remember as well, most of the time Aboriginal people are really grateful for Western medicine and the things that we can do, particularly with a lot of the health issues that our people face, a lot of the chronic disease and whatnot. But sometimes it ain't the be-all and end-all for them and they might be looking more for traditional healers. So thankfully there's a service here now available for people if they're wanting a traditional healer. And that person can come to the hospital. They might be able to come to your clinic. So, again, I can forward those details to you, Gavin. Yeah. It's a a really good thing. Yeah. I think we've covered a lot of the information I want to ask. Yeah. Uh, Is there anything that you can think of that we haven't covered? No, I think we've covered, you know, again, just word of the day for me is just diversity. Like I said, we're just so different. Lots and lots of common things with Aboriginal people, but also lots of differences as well, different needs, different cultures. Um, But, you know, again, I'd speak for myself just as far as, my recommendations around how to provide culturally safe clinics or areas or whatever is doing things like like you're already doing. You know, have, just have something up in your wall that says we're located on Ghana land, even on your email signature, which you've got as well. Well, I know a lot of people are doing that now, but these little things really speak loudly in a really good way. And so that before you even get in the door, you're going, oh, cool. Yeah, it's cool. I know I did when I first walked into your into your clinic. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to know if you're able to tell me how you say thank you in Ghana. Oh, good one. And yes, Chalia. Nachal- yeah, Nachalia. Nachala, Nachala Kendall. Yeah, Nachalia. It's been fantastic. Yeah. I hope it's been useful. Like I said, I'm not an expert on anything or anything. I just speak from my experiences and... Yeah, which I've loved. I've loved every aspect of my work and I do miss the kind of medical area. But, yeah, just now working in education and doing similar things, so it's good. Well, it's been brilliant. It sounds like you're in three different communities. You've got the Indigenous community, you've got the educational community and you've had the healthcare community too. Yeah, very blessed to sort of work across those areas and just be part of the community. Well, Natalia Kendall. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for being on Aussie Med Ed. Thank Thank you very much. And I really appreciate your time and explaining a bit of the Indigenous culture and the the sensitivities we need to be aware of in in health industry. And I really appreciate your efforts and everything. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And yeah, it's been really good. I appreciate it. And I've got one more word for you. It's when we say see you later, we say nakada. 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 Yeah. Nakada, Kendall. Nakada. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much for listening to our podcast today. I'd like to remind you that the information provided is just general advice and may vary depending on your, the region which you are practising or being treated. If you have any concerns or questions about what we've discussed, you should seek advice from your general practitioner. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to our podcast and please subscribe to the podcast for the next episode. Until then, please stay safe.